You're watching the Letterman Podcast with Mike Chisholm, endorsed by the Hello Deli. Yeah! <laughs> Welcome once again to the Letterman Podcast. My name is Mike Chisholm. I love uh, when this show, and I mentioned it a little bit on the show, so I'll try not to reiterate it too much in the intro, but I love when this show uh, naturally, organically has patterns emerge, uh, sometimes just by with the booking of the guests that we have, um, and then the subsequent booking at right after or a couple of guests later, there's callbacks, there's all sorts of things, uh, trends, little trends that develop uh, and have developed within this show. I love that, how it organically happens. None of it is planned, as you can well uh, imagine. We uh, Very little is planned here, uh, and it shows. But that being said, uh, organically, these patterns do emerge. Well, what's been happening now is we've had a lot of folks who were interns for the show, and it's the summertime at the time of uh, the re release of these particular batch of episodes. And so what I think we're going to do here is have the summer intern series, in, and uh, we're probably uh three or four interns into it already uh but we've got a few interns that are have popped up and would love to tell their stories uh on the letterman podcast and 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 it's funny i had a longtime staff member fairly recently say to me hey make sure you get as many interns as you can the interns all have uh, have all the good stories and certainly it is a different vantage point you know you've got uh these bright-eyed you know many times young most of the time young people who show up work for free for the production that is either late night with David Letterman or late show with David Letterman. And they're working with these people who um, are, are, are fast paced and, and um, you know, in the grind of things. Right. And it's a very self deprecating group and it's a very tight knit group. It's a family, uh, you know, for sure. And then you have these people come in and join in and they become part of it for a season. Sometimes they get hired on and they stay. Um, you know, the gentleman today uh, who's on, his name is Mike Summers. He was on for, he was at, at, at Letterman. Uh, for an intern season and and then stayed on for a little while longer than before moving over to Rosie and then working for George Lucas is a great, pretty crazy story coming out uh, of this episode with that a guy who got to work for George Lucas and um, that's it's kind of a neat story but um, Mike is really cool at a certain point in this episode he shows us a Polaroid of of him uh, dressed as an elf by Sue Hum and there's two other people and uh, uh, Chris Shuki, Shukai is one of them, and and Tommy Rupert is the other one. Tommy's been on the show here. Chris is coming on the show uh, very soon. And then Mike Summers is on today. So kind of neat um, little little stories that come from these episodes here. I love that the Letterman podcast can be a conduit for some of these people who have moved on to other careers. Uh, but not, it seems universally that the interns for Late Show with David Letterman certainly, certainly – uh, not just remember, but were impacted and forever um, imprinted because of their time working at either Late Night uh, with David Letterman or Late Show with David Letterman. This is an example of that. So as part of our uh, The Letterman Podcast Summer Intern Series, I would like to present Mike Summers. Okay, so uh, what has... It's so funny how when this show... Uh, you know, evolves itself and, and some of the things that happen, um, you know, patterns start to happen. Like we'll have certain writers who ended up working with other writers. And then a couple of weeks later, when that writer team left, we'll have the writer team that took over for them or, or, or we'll start with some music, uh, some uh, a musical guest, and then suddenly it'll evolve into other people who were related. And it's really neat how organically this is happening. The summer of 23 for the Letterman podcast has become intern, uh, bonus episodes because we're going to have I believe we're going to have every single week we're going to have enough uh, in the can that we can put out an episode uh, each week of folks who interned for the show somebody who worked for the show for a long time said to me uh, good make sure you get the interns on there the interns have all the best stories and I can <laughs> tell you uh, Mike Summers uh, is a guy who still has the energy that he had when he interned for Late Show with David Letterman. Mike, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come on here onto the Letterman podcast and talk about your memories working for Dave and company. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, this is so exciting. Now, okay, um, let, let's do the first question is, what year did you intern and what are you doing now? That's how we're going to start with this and then we'll go backwards here in a minute. Exactly. So I was an intern in 1995 in the fall. It was my last semester of college from the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. 
uh, did that. And then I was lucky enough because it was my last semester of school, I actually got hired on. Um, not in a full-time capacity, but to hire or to, to kind of train or orient the, the new interns for the following semester. So that was kind of an exciting gig and uh, just graduated college, just did this amazing internship with Letterman in the fall. And then I got hired on in the spring. So that was kind of cool. Oh, that's fantastic. So what do you do now? So 95, yes. almost 20 years ago, uh, what are we doing now? Yeah. So when well, I left Letterman, I worked. I should say. Yeah. So I left Letterman. I worked for Rosie O'Donnell for a while because Daniel Kellison left to become executive producer over there, took me with him, went over there for a few years um, and then worked for George Lucas briefly doing a project in Chicago, the museum project, which didn't materialize. Yeah. But that was. An, yeah. Right. That was an amazing experience. So while the story's there as well. Um, and then worked at a university, NYU, for a long time. And now I'm back in the Chicago area working in hospitality. Oh, good for you, man. Yeah, I can definitely ask you some questions about that uh, that museum. Um, that's 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 very very cool. Okay, so um, safe to say you were a fan of of David Letterman and, and and his productions long before you became an intern there. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the internship just kind of fell into my lap. I was studying sociology. I wasn't studying television or production or anything like that. Went to the career center, the internship center at the university, and just kind of thumbing through the old books because you know we had books then. We didn't have yeah. everything was an internet and everything yeah. like that. Um, and found I'm like, well, let's apply. Let's you know, let's see what happens. Got a phone call from Morty's office. Uh, oh, I don't know, a week or two later, after I sent in my little snail mail application, and uh, next thing I knew, I was on a plane out there for an interview. Came home, told my parents I was moving out there for the last semester of college. They shrugged, and there I was. Wow, um, that is that is incredibly exciting. You go to the library, uh, you you go through the books to see the uh, the different intern opportunities that are out there. You see Late Show with David Letterman, um, and 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 at that point, was your mind kind of like, like did it just go off in the direction of dreaming that kind of a thing, or did you hand out a stack of them and this one happened to say yes? Oh, this was just a dream. I mean, this was a dream. This was a far shot dream. This was something that wasn't going to materialize. It's like, you know what? What the hell? I'm getting ready to graduate. Let's do this. Let's see what happens. And sure enough, I got the phone call. I'm like, shit. I'm sorry. Wow. I hope it's okay to say that. I hope yeah, it's okay yeah, yeah, to absolutely. say that on the air. But, absolutely. Wow. So that, that was amazing. Never had been to New York before, anything like that. You know, flew on my little plane, spent the night in some flea bag hotel the night before so I wouldn't be late to my interview. Showed up with my little suitcase, left it with the security desk off, uh, you know, off of Broadway there. And yep. uh, yeah, here I am. Wow. Okay, so let's talk about the interview. So never been in New York before. Uh, you find your way down to the Ed Sullivan Theater. When you get there, are you um, are you intimidated as you walk in there? Oh, sure. I mean, I was intimidated enough to being in New York let alone walking to Letterman studio. I yep. mean, of all places, go into the little, I, I probably yanked on the front door to start, not knowing that that wasn't where you go in, you just go around the corner, but yep. eventually found my way over there. And uh, I mean, security was of course amazing and nice. And, you know, they knew I was coming and all that good stuff and went upstairs. Can't remember who I interviewed with. I want to say it might've been Zoe. It might've been Zoe Friedman. I'm not, right. mis I'm not entirely sure, but Zoe. And then of course, uh, Susan Schreier in Morty's office. I know I met with those two folks for sure. And I'm sorry if I'm forgetting anyone important. I don't, I apologize. I'm old. What can I say? But yeah, so it, yeah, it was intimidating, but it was exciting. It was really exciting. Do you remember the types of things that they asked you? Oh gosh, no. no. I'm sure they asked me where I go to school. What am I studying? Why do I want to do this? All that kind of good stuff. I'm sure I gave them some bogus answer to get in the door and uh, it stuck. It worked. So my um, acting skills were good. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Right. Okay, so that first day you go through however many one or two people, that kind of a thing. Um, you're released back into the wild. Do you do you spend any time in New York or do you go right home? No, I had the day to kill in New York because you know I'm 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 heaven forbid I miss a flight. So I think I had probably six or seven hours to kill after that. So you know I bummed around. I think I well, I remember on one of the bus rides to the airport or something to go back. Eventually, I thought I was going through Central Park. Like, wow, this is Central Park. I don't think it was. I think it was just some <laughs> random park, probably in Queens or something like that. But I thought it was Central Park. So that was a good enough story for me. I'm like, you know what? I, I'm not going to get this internship. But boy, I got to see Central Park. I got yep. to see the Letterman offices, not the studio, but the offices, all that yep. good stuff. I'm like, yeah, I'm really living here. You got a story and, yeah. out of it. Yeah, yeah. And then okay. I realized, yeah, it wasn't the big park. So, So you get home. And how long is it till you get the call? 
I want to say it might have been a week or two. It was pretty quick. It was pretty quick, honestly. And I remember when I flew out for the uh, for the interview. I'm oh, I'm gonna say probably during the summer at some point. I was interning for a radio station in Chicago at the time, Q101. Yeah. Um, so I want to say that probably ended up or uh, maybe June, July. And then I was out there, you know, right before the semester started in August. I think I had just missed the anniversary, you know, photo, whatever they do um, in August. Because I want to say it's like August 3rd or something like that. I'm probably wrong on that date. So I'm sure lots sure. of people will correct me on that. But yeah, so it was, yeah, it was, I probably got out there around August 15th or so. Wow. 20th, okay. 15th. Um, which is, which is fascinating to me because I mean, you're in the middle of your summer, you're working for a radio station, which in my, in, you know, from everything I've heard. I'm certain that is something that probably served you a little bit, at least from a first first impression standpoint. A lot of people who study broadcasting were into the broadcasting thing, but you're a sociology guy, end up at a radio station, yeah. leapfrogging over to Letterman. So funny, so great um, that you could do that. Now you get you get the notification that it's happening. Uh, how long was it until you were situated somewhere in New York? Where did you stay at first? Because uh, that that you know. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere is, 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 is a phrase for a reason. It's not exactly oh, yeah. the easiest place to get established. Um, how did that, how did that all turn out? Yeah. Yeah. It was a bit of a mad scramble. Um, yeah. So I had a friend who had a friend who lived in New Jersey, who the friend was thinking of eating a place in Hoboken. So we met up or we talked on, not even by email. I don't think we had email back then. I don't think, I don't know how we did this. I guess we talked on the phone, old fashioned. I don't know. But yeah. um, we figured it out and I like moved out there and we hit it off. We got a place in Hoboken, pricey, uh, yeah. but you know, a little bit of a dump uh, of a place to begin with. And uh, just started from there. And luckily I had parents who supported me along the way and, and made it all work for me. And uh, it was an unpaid internship. I mean, yeah. I don't know what it's like, you know, nowadays, but it was unpaid back then. You had to get school credit, of course. But uh, so it was, it was a, it was a tough semester, but you know, it, you, I was scrappy um, and all the inter other interns were scrappy. So we found our fun. Um, and yeah. of course we look, we worked long days. So it wasn't like, you know, we were bored at any point, but yeah, we found our little watering holes and all that kind of good stuff to, to eat and drink on the cheap and all that. So, so yeah, it was a mad scramble, but it all worked out and I made some really great friends. And then I ended up staying out there for the next 20 some odd years uh, and made it work. So. Um, okay. So you're, you're, you, you're there. You're not taking, you didn't take another job. So you could work as many hours as they would have you there. And were Correct. you the, were you the guy that said, Oh yeah, extra hours, no problem. Like I'll stay as long as like, were you kind of the, as you were there, was this one of those things where you're like, I want to entrench myself into this, uh, this experience. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, sh I probably in hindsight should have gotten a little part-time job or something in addition to that, but you know, I was, I was doing the whole letterman thing. Oops, sorry. That's okay. There we go. Technology. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I mean, it was basically Monday through Friday. Um, even when they were on hiatus, I believe that year they went out to the Academy Awards, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, not the Academy Awards, the the, the Oscars. So, not the Oscars. The Emmys? The TV Awards. The, the Emmys. Emmys. There yeah, you go. Yeah. It's been a while. Um, the Emmys. And, uh, you know, during a hiatus, the, the interns kind of ran the show over there all alone in the offices and stuff. So... That was kind of fun answering all the phones and doing all that kind of stuff. But yeah, it was, it was pretty full time. I, I want to say we probably started around 10 a.m. every day. Yep. And I had about what, 30, 45 minute commute from Hoboken to get up there. And I was poor and cheap. So, you know, I would walk, not take the subway when I could. So, you know, we'd do all that. 10 a lot. And I say we'd get out there probably around six, seven o'clock at night or so. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I got to ask, let's go right back to the first day. Do you remember your first day? Do you remember the orientation? I do kind of. I remember a little bit of paperwork, not a ton of paperwork. It wasn't like tons of forms and NDAs that I can remember anything like that. So, yeah, um, but yeah I just remember kind of being nervous walking around, meeting the other interns. I think they might have sent us a, a list of the other interns and phone numbers. So I, I may have reached out to a few of them just to kind of introduce myself and go from there. Yeah. But, uh, but it was it was they were really welcoming. I mean, you know, you think, you know, television, New York, all that, it's going to be, you know, cutthroat. Sure, there are cutthroat parts of it, but they were really welcoming. So I never felt, it was never awkward. It was never awkward. And when you started, where was the, uh, you know, did you, there there are lots of stories of, of interns who go around to different departments and they figure out kind of where they're going to place people. And there's other stories where they know uh, exactly where they're placed the day that they get there. Which were you? I was in the talent department. So I was working with all the talent bookers and all that, doing all of the, you know, um, pulling, pulling the clips, pulling the running notes for Dan and Mary, Mary Connolly. 
um, the, you know, the blue cards and everything all over the place. And then I got roped into, in a good way, I got roped into kind of being in Dave's office a little bit. So um, I was the person who'd kind of run and get the lunch every day for Dave, uh, which was really exciting. But there's a good story there too. I was terrified one day. I don't know if you want to go there now. Oh, or please, yeah, let. go. Let's 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 yeah. do it. So you know, Dave's a creature of habit, um, in a, in a good way. And uh, he'd have his pasta every day, and I'd go pick it up. And I want to say it was Bond or Century. I can't remember the place. I can remember. I can remember the place. It was you know a big open cavernous type restaurant, very retro, very like uh, maybe 1920s. So I want to say it's like Bond or something like that. So, you know, we can have a standing order and I'd have to go pick it up. And, you know, I'm walking through Times Square and it's, you know, it's summer. It's still warm out. It's August, September. And uh, the, the paper bag ripped and, oh, and, no. and, 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 and down goes Dave's lunch all over the pavement. And, you know, I, I, what do I do? We didn't have cell phones and beepers and I didn't have a beeper. There were beepers, but um, I'm like, shit, what do I do? So I, I kind of panicked. I couldn't run all the way back to the studio and explain it to Lori and, and, um, and, and Casey that, you know, I dropped lunch. What do I do? Yeah. I, so I, I went back there and I just kind of explained and begged and pleaded. And, you know, they fired up the grill and did whatever they do to, to make more pasta. And I scurried back a little bit late, um, but uh, it all worked. But boy, was I terrified. You know, here's a big, you know, I should have probably sold that because I'm sure if I would have told a tourist in Times Square that that's, that's Dave Letterman's lunch right there, <laughs> I probably could have made a mint per noodle. I mean, literally made a mint. I was terrified. <laughs> But it all worked out. But I, I, that that will always stick with me. That's always one of those boy. You know, we didn't have plastic bags back then. I'm old. But yeah. paper bags, that, <laughs> that son of a gun ripped right through. So, yeah. And you went and got Dave's lunch every day for a while. That's uh, that's 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 pretty cool. Um, yeah, it is cool. Being able to say that you did that. I mean, again, because you are you are a huge, you know, you are a huge fan of the show as well. Uh, was it hard for you to be a big fan of the show? And work there was it one of those things? You know, we hear I hear from other people that, you know, the enthusiasm we have for it, we had to kind of temper that down there, you know. But at the end of the day, inside, we all knew what we were doing and what we were working for. Was that something that you had to reconcile, or did you get to it pretty easily? For me, it was pretty easy. I mean, I come from pretty humble roots in the Midwest here, so uh, well, humble roots in the Midwest. Uh, so I, you know, I'm a big fan, but I wasn't a rabid fan. I wasn't like, you know, when I'd answer the phone and you know, all the the people in Europe when it was daytime when it was airing there would call drunk and you know, be all that. You know, I wasn't quite that rabid. Sorry, English people. Sorry, Europeans. What you want me to say? Yeah, let's um, talk about that. Yeah. No, no, no. Hold on, hold on. So what would <laughs> what is, what what would be happening in the middle of the day? The Europeans are calling into the. Oh, it's kind of fun. You know, so when the, when we'd be taping the show, so I guess it would probably sync up with their airtime or, or however that works. Yeah. And again, this wasn't on demand back then. This was this was live TV, yep. live TV in the sense of its broadcast, you know, at a particular moment in time. But, uh, you know, we'd watch the switchboard. We'd, we'd answer the phones in, in Dave's office and, you know, the town office, you know, all, all over the place, you know, while they're doing the taping after we had done all our running around and while they're actually taping the show. And yep. we'd get the I'd get calls. From, you know, people watching the show, having fun, maybe imbibing a little bit. Maybe it was a Friday. Maybe it was a Thursday. It doesn't really matter the day of the week. But people were having fun watching the show, had a little bit to drink. They'd be calling up. You know, I'd, I'd hear a lot of Scottish accents, a lot of English accents. I mean, all over the place, you know. And somehow they'd find the number through the, the switchboard or whatever for, you know, the general number or possibly Dave's number. I'm not giving out that number, even though it's no good. I'm not giving it out. But uh, <laughs> I, do, I do still have the call sheet. I do still have a copy of the call sheet. But um, but yeah, I would answer the phone. You know, we'd have a little fun with them, you know, in a professional way. As sure. a professional as a 21-year-old can be. But uh, But yeah. Um, okay. So that's during taping. That's, 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 that's hilarious. I've never heard that before. That's, uh, that's, that's super cool. Um, okay. So let's go back to you working for Daniel and Mary. I mean, you know, and we're talking, we talk about this time, um, you know, in place and, 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 you know, for the first couple of years at CBS, um, you know, a lot of the, 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 the crew that was there was the crew from NBC. You know, they ran at that breakneck speed to, to, to get late show up and running and going. And then there was a bit of an exodus at that point there from some of these people. They went off for different projects and things. It seems like you were there right in that right in that sweet spot of 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 you know these people coming. A lot of them coming to the end of this massive sprint that they've done. Um, you know, it must have been really really interesting uh, working with Daniel and Mary. Um, I don't I don't know if you were there for the Madonna moment, but like you're around. It's around that time. That that yeah. that you're there. The guests are all a list. Um, the uh, the pressure uh, never greater. Um, 
that must have been a very, very cool environment to be in every day, but it must have been extremely stressful as well. It was. It was a really cool time. And, and you hit it right on the head there. Uh, it was the sweet spot. You know, we're coming off a late night. We're going into late show. We're in year two, three, all A-listers, all A-listers. I mean, we had the people where, you know, if Liz Rosenberg calls, you find Daniel right away. You drop yeah. everything. Come hell or high water, you find him. Things like that. Yeah. Um, and constantly on the whiteboards, constantly moving around the guests for even that day yeah. just to make it all work. Because again, people were fighting for spots on the show. People were yeah. literally fighting for spots on the show. And I wish I had been a little bit older when I was there because I didn't fully know all of the staffers from late night. Right. Um, but I mean, they're legends, they're legends, but I didn't know them. I'm sure I ran into them and talked to them a million times when they were either stopping by or still involved. It's you no know, Meryl Marco, you know, involved in some way or another, but I, I didn't know and appreciate it at the time. And nor did we have, you know, cell phones with cameras at the ready all the time. And it's probably a better thing because I probably would have gotten canned, as, you know, as soon as I got in the door for taking yeah. pictures and all that kind of good stuff. But, you know, every now and then we'd have one of those little, you know, uh, cardboard disposable cameras at the ready and we'd get lucky or, you know, get an autograph here and there. So that was fun. But, yeah, it was it was an amazing time. And like I say, I wish I was a little bit older so I could appreciate it even more than I did. Yeah. But what a gr what a great thing right out of college i mean come on what better place to work well and then in the talent uh department i mean you're seeing these people as they come in too like are you are you preparing their gift bags and handing the gift bags out and things like that or what what are some of the what are some of the things that you would do are you re helping to research uh like what are some of the things that you're helping daniel and mary with like how yeah, describe I mean some of the tasks that you had it's pretty much anything that comes through your way. I mean, you know, there could be, you know, hopping in a limo quick. And, and again, limos back in the day, not just a, a town car or sedan. It was a limo um, yeah. to like run something to some celebrity's house or to their publicist or whatever, yeah. uh, de delivering gift bags. I was there during the holidays. So delivering all of the jackets uh, that Dave was given out to the different celebrities and publicists and all that kind of good stuff. Um, helping with last minute green room requests that needed to be done um changes in the blue cards and the notes that would go you know to the to the director's little pit down in the down in the cellar there yeah. and all that good stuff i mean it, literally anything and everything or you know mike go find a bottle of dom perignon well you know what do i know about <laughs> dom perignon you know i know rot gut i don't know dom perignon at that age what am i doing and 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 just somehow acquiring this specific bottle at some random liquor store that you know I'd I'd hopefully had already scoped out and just getting it. I don't know how I even paid for it. I can't even remember how I paid for it. I certainly <laughs> didn't have deep pockets to pay for it. They must have sent me with money. I'm guessing. I don't remember. But anyway, it was just the high of every single day, running around, never knowing what you're going to do. But it was all exciting. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so who are some of the uh. Who are the, some of the celebrities or some of the moments that you bu uh, bumped shoulders with that while you were there that uh, stick with you to this day? I love Carol Burnett. Um, when Carol oh, was on, what an I, answer. I had just I had just seen her on Broadway or off Broadway in Moon Over Buffalo, and uh, I kept my playbill. And when I, you know, she was one I wanted to meet. So, you know, I kind of talked to, the, you know, one of the talent people and, you know, so they arranged to have me help them bring something up to her dressing room, you know, during before the show. And I, I had my playbill and she was so gracious to sign it for me. And I was just tickled pink. Again, we didn't have cameras at the ready, yep. nor probably should we. Yep. But I remember talking to her. I'm like, you know, I wish I had a camera. She's like, oh, next time, sweetie. Darn it if that didn't happen. So when she was in Chicago at the Chicago Theater, probably about at this point, so this is 2023, so probably back in like 2016 or so, she was performing. And, you know, I kind of, you know, being in the industry, um, I kind of knew who to look for. So I found a, I, I found a guy that was kind of hanging out toward the side of the stage toward the end of the show. Yeah. And I went over to him and he looked like he's her guy. So I went up to him. I'm like, you know, I explained really quickly my Letterman story. I'm like, I was an intern. I had her sign the playbill. We didn't have cameras back then. She said, next time, sweetie. This is my one next time I'm ever going to get. Yeah. So he pulls me in the line. I go backstage. I meet her. I get my picture with her. Fantastic. So it all went full circle. And then I saw, um, of course, a few years later on Broadway and went down and chatted with her for a few minutes. But that's neither here nor there. But the point is, it's like it all went full circle. So she was one of them. Mary Tyler Moore was another one. Oh, my didn't God. Have this, yeah. Didn't have the same interaction with her that I had with Carol Burnett. Yeah. She was she was super sweet, I thought. Um, she had a, She had a bigger entourage, I thought um so you know her hair her makeup people all that kind of came along for the ride so um it was a little more difficult to have a conversation but i did say hi um and that was all i needed that was all i needed and then of course there's the other big names you know uh, some of them stand out as being a little not as uh, friendly in person as maybe like the carol burnett's of the world yeah, yeah. but uh 
a few musicians who didn't like to let us sit, you know, dur- so during rehearsals, they'd sometimes let us sit in the back, you know, kind of yep. listen, you know, quite, yep. quite listen. There were one or two that didn't want any of that going on. So, uh, you know, so we kind of missed out on that. No, I'm not a huge fan anymore, but yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll I Letterman I am. Well, of course. Well, yeah, it clearly uh, very much so. And it's, 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 it's cool to see that enthusiasm still. Um, what are and some, this might uh, be no- a rel- and this might and the person I'm speaking about maybe a relative of Roxy Roker if that's a hint to any of our viewers out there. Oh, there we go. Maybe a, maybe a musician relative of Roxy Roker. I think I've got that right. Let's get the uh, let's get the detectives on this one. <laughs> yeah, Sounds that's good. right. <laughs> uh, send in your answer, and we'll tell you if you're right. Um, yeah. The uh, so some of the rehearsals that you would watch, um, like so, this is basically at the end of the day that the talent has been wrangled. You're you know, Mary and Daniel are kind of set things to go you can go off to the, the the actual theater itself and you can watch some of the rehearsals. We just had Harvey Goldberg on who has been the, um, he mixed basically, you know, he's been mixing music for the last five decades, uh, most of the entire late show run. And he actually did a really good job talking about, um, you know, the, the, the route from when the gear was loaded into, you know, the rehearsal to what it took to the performance and final mix. Uh, you would see some of these performances or, or rehearsals for the performances and at a time where he was booking the biggest musical acts that you could think of, um, any that are, are are notable to you, where it's like, oh my god, I got to see you know this artist here, kind of casual and just you know loose and letting things uh, experimenting a little bit on stage. You know, this is where I'm going to sound spoiled because I worked for Letterman. I don't have a favorite because they were all amazing, and I know that sounds just like a standard kiss ass answer, no, but no, it's no, not. No. I mean, no. we got spoiled. We got spoiled. We got spoiled. I mean, there was nothing that stood out particularly because everyone was A-list or 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 better than A-list. I mean, wow. yeah. <laughs> wow. I mean, I can remember moments with Dave walking down the hallway, you know, tossing the football with Walter and stuff, you know, as they're going to the studio. Stuff like that stands out to me because it's just so surreal and it was so uh-huh. cool. And I'm literally like walking down the hallway as they're like tossing the ball, you know, back and forth. Like things like that stand out to me. But the performers don't necessarily because it was it was an everyday occurrence. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Um, okay, so I want to get to your. You got some pictures here that you sent me, and let's see if I can get to them nice and quickly. I should be able to. There we go. Okay, can you see these? Yeah. Yes, I can. All right. So what do we got here for those who are on uh, who are on the audio, um, as opposed to the YouTube? This might be a section that you want to come over to the YouTube for. But uh, we're showing a picture of Dave, and who are we looking at here, Mike? That that is my mom, Sherry. She oh. flew out to visit me, and I was lucky enough to take her to the holiday party in 1995. Um, he rented out, I don't know if it was called Woman Rink at the time, the ice skating rink in Central Park. And uh, that's where we had our holiday party that year. And I think she got to see the taping that day, if I'm not mistaken. I think we somehow smuggled her into the audience yep. so, uh, while, I was work- while I was working. And uh, then afterwards, you know, she hung out for a little bit, bummed around a little bit. And uh, we went to the rink and skated. And uh, yeah, she got her picture with Dave. That's fantastic. Um, oh, big red. Yeah, Alan. That's Alan, of course. I, now, that's not during the years I was there. That was at nope. a subsequent visit to the set. But uh, Alan, I think it just started. I think literally he, I think it was like day one for him, fall of 95, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Someone will correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, but yeah, Alan was cool. And I actually got to see him at NYU once. I think his kid graduated from the university when I was working there. So uh, it was nice to run into Alan and get a picture with him. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, you know, we, we unfortunately never had a chance to have him on our show, but uh, uh, everybody has just, you know, gushed about how kind of a man Alan is and how talented he is. Um, just a fantastic fixture uh, when it comes to Late Show. Um, Alan, what a, gr- what a great guy Alan is. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this one is going to take a little bit of uh, a little bit of explanation. What do we got going on here, sir? So uh, there I am. I got recruited, you know, because of my height. I'm, I'm, I'm super, super tall. Um, I got recruited to be an elf along with two of our folks from the research department at the time. And you, okay, uh, can we name them? Can we name these people? I, I should know. I know the ones in TV now. Uh, the one does news, I believe, out in the out in the West somewhere. Uh-huh. Um, I know them. They're both Facebook friends. I'm embarrassed to say. I remember you guys. I just don't remember your names offhand because I'm on the spot on the air. But um, <laughs> but yeah, they. <laughs> that's you, okay you're, you're, it'll come in, it'll come afterwards in the comments this is great it's fine I, I i'm sure you'll know them i'm sure people know them i know them i just can't think of names because i'm old uh but yeah uh we, we were dressed up as elves and we were going to do a skit a bit where uh 
you know, we were in the back of a taxi. We were going to hop out of the taxis. It screeched up to the strip club in New York. And I think Dave was going to hop out of the, you know, out of the back seat of the taxi and run into the strip club or something. But the weather did take a little bit of a turn. It got super icy and stuff. I think Dave might have slipped a little bit and, you know, was so anyway, so we sat and holding in the studio and that's, up, you know, upstairs in the offices there. Um, we, uh, we sat there and sat there and eventually got cut. So I didn't get my SAG card or anything like that out of the deal, but I did get a really cool Polaroid picture. <laughs> and Sue Hum dressed you guys up for this? Oh yeah, Sue Hum dressed us up. I wish I still had that outfit. Actually, that'd come in <laughs> pretty handy. But uh, but yeah, no, she Sue Hum dressed up. It was actually really fun to you know get a little bit of makeup, a little bit of rouge on the cheeks, that little outfit, hang out with the guys for a little bit, and then get sent home with uh with no airtime. <laughs> oh look at this! That's the Again, same party, the I assume. Yeah, the holiday party. Of course, Paul, my mom, Sherry, me. Uh, you know, yucking it up over at Central Park there, enjoying probably a non-alcoholic beverage i'm sure um and just having fun yeah I, i'm super glad my mom got to go out there i wish my dad would have been able to he was he was he was quite ill at the time uh, from cancer so he didn't ever get out to oh. make make it out there to visit me in new york but I, I would have loved to have brought him as well but uh but yeah my mom was my date that's awesome and then of course here we are yeah oh yeah with the man himself um that's you right know, we've heard a lot of stories that at the holiday parties he would he would definitely make himself available for almost everybody um did you now you did work in the office with Lori and Casey and whatnot. Um, yeah. Were you first name basis with Dave? Did you see him every day? Did you see him every other? Because some are in interns worked there the entire time. They never saw him once kind of a thing. So it, it seems like you got to see him more than many of the other interns. Yeah, I saw him pretty much daily. I don't know if it was because I was just really nerdy and good at phones, but uh, one of my jobs in the morning when I would get there, and I think I was usually one of the first ones in because I'm never late. Um, so I'd be there pretty early. So uh, at one point they were going to have me either be the person to meet him to park his car for him um, and or answer phones. Well, I ended up answering phones because while I learned on a stick shift, there was no way in hell that I was going to park Dave's stick shift as I'm pulling away and he's getting out of the car. Here's the gears grinding. So that was not <laughs> going to happen. I, I I voluntarily opted myself out of it. I think I sat in the car once just so I could say I did. Yep. I never drove it. Was um, it and then, you know, was, they was it the stealth or was it something uh, a little higher than that? I want to say it was probably a little higher than that. I, I'm, you know, I'm not really a car guy, so I don't know. It was, it was just a really, really, really nice, fast car that I wasn't about to break. <laughs> um, so, so, so yeah, I, I would do that, but my job was basically to be on Dave's floor answering the phones while, uh, oh, I can't think of the name. He'd go downstairs and move the car for Dave, uh, when he'd pull up in the morning. So, um, so I would answer the phone. So, and then I would buzz Dave in and, you know, a few times I would just be so enamored be like, morning, Dave, um, that I forget to push the little buzzer to let him in. So he'd be yanking on the door and I'd be like, Oh, sorry about that. So I think he got used to it after a while, but, uh, no, he was super cool. He never got mad. Maybe wow. yanked on that door a few times, but yeah, that was pretty cool. So yeah, I saw him pretty much on a daily basis. And then every now and like I say, we'd see him in the hallway, you know, walk into the studio or whatever. You know, they pretty much try to clear the hallway. You know, I mean, understandably, he's got places to be, things to do. Yeah. Um, you know, his, his little his little elevator ride downstairs. But um, but yeah, I'd see him. I'd see him coming and going quite often. So I, I, I was very fortunate in that regard. Um, I guess I knew where to hang out at the right times. <laughs> but yeah. Right. Um, okay, so... Well, you were in the intern role, were you talent department the entire time? I was, yeah. I was talent department. A little bit more breadth and depth. Again, I you know, I don't know how many people in the talent department actually ran the cards down to the director's area and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. I don't know if it's just no, I'm trying to sign modest here. I don't I don't know. I just I, I was a reliable person. So I think people tended to lean on me to do things like drop Dave's lunch in the middle of Times Square. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think so. I, you know, I tried to, I tried to learn as much as I could, to be honest with you and try to be in as many places as I could as well. And then when I got hired on again, luck of the draw, having it be my last semester and all, but um, you know, I was able to stay on, I was able to get even more breadth and depth because then I was kind of kind of acclimating the new interns to all the areas more or less. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. And then of course, you know, intern alley was just right around the corner from Paul's office. So we'd see Paul often as well. So. Um, okay, so that was the question uh, that I was going to ask here. So when 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 the internship ended, um, was it seamless as to when you got hired? It's like, yeah, we know we're going to keep three or four interns, and they they they, they kept you, or did you have to kind of re up, re interview again? And and uh, no, what it, department did you end up at? Like, were you technically part of like the page program? Or, like, what part of the in, uh, uh, did you get hired to do? No, so I didn't have to re-up or anything like that. It was just basically an offer like, hey, Mike, you want to stay on? I'm like, yeah, nice. <laughs> do I ever? Do I ever? Yeah. Um, but yeah, 
no, I didn't have to do anything like that. And I was still part of the, the intern program. I didn't, I wasn't a page or anything like that. Okay. Um, and it was still technically, technically talent department. But then again, the, the, the reach and the breadth and depth of talent department was everywhere. So it wasn't like, uh, you know, talent had its, had its tentacles on everything. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So honestly, it was probably the best place to be for that automatic, just kind of stay on for a few weeks or whatever the heck it was, collect a little bit of a paycheck. I had applied for a job that was open down in, um, uh, down in the the pants office, the worldwide pants, the you know the the, yep. the production office. Yeah, uh, I applied for a job down there as a receptionist. I didn't get that job. Yeah, still bitter about that. Uh, but no, <laughs> I didn't get that one. But you know, I, I think it showed that I had an interest, and I and I was graduating. So again, luck of the draw. A lot of the other the other interns, the kids were going back to school. So this kid was done. So I stayed on, and that was fun. Yeah, and how long did you stay on for? Uh, it was a few weeks. I, I can't imagine it was more than a month or two at most. It wasn't very long it was long enough to, to collect a paycheck and to still yeah. be part of the magic, but not, you know, not long by a long stretch. And then after I left, I was, I was waiting tables at a Johnny Rockets, you know, doing little fifties songs and serving cheap burgers and stuff like that. But, yeah. uh, and then that's when I got the call about uh, going over with Daniel to, um, to uh, Rosie's show, which was starting up over at uh, 30 rock. So, yeah. And this is, uh, this is actually, I'm, I, was, I was fascinated to know that. So you may answer part of my question there. So, it wasn't quite seamless, but it was pretty close. I was going to ask while you were there, did you know that the exodus was going to start happening and that Daniel was going to move over or, or uh, like, how did that news reach you uh, after you had left? There was some buzz about Rosie's show coming on, but I don't know if I knew that Daniel was leaving necessarily, though I was lucky enough at one point because uh, I was, so was, it was Rosie, of course. And then Daniel, I think, Aside from other people I probably didn't know about, I think I was probably like the second or third person hired. I was basically pre-production for Rosie's show with Daniel, and we were working out of uh, Carney Wilson's old offices for her show that was wrapping up at the time. Um, and oh. uh, we worked out of those offices. Total shithole. But they were offices nonetheless. And uh, <laughs> we basically just got everything. And part of my job was really just kind of following Daniel around, going to some of the nicer hotels as he was interviewing some of the producers and stuff that were going to come in for the new show. So my job was kind of sit in the lobby and, you know, look my prettiest and uh, make sure that I had all the files ready to go and make sure, you know, when lunch needed to be ordered that we'd get lunch for them for their lunch interviews and things like that. And then eventually moved over to 30 Rock and did all that kind of good stuff. And I was there for a while. But uh, yeah, 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 it was cool. And oh, wow. oh, so yeah, so I was lucky enough during all of that paperwork shuffling and me being the, the holder of the paperwork to, to actually come across the notes. And he had he had a list of interns, recent interns, and there were little notes next to that, like a little, um, everything was amazing for people who are listening, but like little interns that he kind of liked and got along with and he thought would do a good job. And my name was circled, you know, there were one or two names circled. So it was really cool about that. So, wow. Uh, yeah. Like, I mean, television history, when you look at, you think about the time that you were at Letterman, uh, television history certainly and then also Rosie getting that show was a big deal um, you know we had we had Robert Morton on here not too long ago and he talked about how you know there was talk and 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 a deal almost you know done and in place that Rosie was going to be Dave's uh, permanent guest host and 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 that didn't happen and one of the ingredients as to why that didn't happen was because Rosie got her own show um, you know right. really really big deal that that happened how long did you stay working for Rosie it wasn't more than a, about six months or so. Um, it was, yeah. you know, it, it was, it was a lot for me. I'll be honest with you. I wasn't an intern then. And I was, I was working mega hours, mega hours for Rosie. And then a Maureen O'Boyle had her own talk show at the time that was out of the same office. Yep. So uh, I was the, I was the correspondence coordinator for that show, uh, for Rosie's show. And uh, it was, it was basically, the, I was the mail guy. Um, I would deliver the mail around and all that good stuff. And then I actually kind of start their little internship program to get that going off the, so it was exciting to be there pre-production. Yep. during the launch of production and into yep. the show. And, you know, uh, the one thing I, I, I remember distinctly about that is I was a fool and I happened to be sick the day that I knew Cher was going to be on. Who calls out sick when Cher is going to be on? I mean, who <laughs> does that? A stupid young person right out of college, that's who. But yeah, no, it was fun. And it was actually, it was fun, just like it was fun to roam around Ed Sullivan and, you know, all the little hallways and just kind of take in the history and all the coolness. It was also fun to kind of roam around the same floor as Saturday Night Live. And Rosie's studio was all right there. And I yep. uh, just can be like, wow, come and go take the, the, the elevator up with Tom Brokaw in the morning. You know, his hair is all bedhead, messed up reading the paper. I'm like, good morning. And, you know, I, I think he kind of nodded. But, you know, but yeah, it was it was it was super cool. It was super cool. Yeah. You know, and, and, and there are so many um, people from different regions of the country uh, that, that I've talked to that whether they either started as an intern or, or we just they know they started and finished as an intern, whatever. Um, 
the the majesty and the magic of New York that I think we all as as you know I'm a Gen Xer growing up New York to certain people especially just kind of calls you and you get there and 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 you know you hope to get a glimpse of what your everyday life was for a time when you were 21 years old that is absolutely uh crazy and 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 dream come true for so many people so many people just would aspire to have the memories that you have locked, uh, you know, bouncing around inside your, uh, your cranium. Uh, what would you say? And, and, you're, and you're so right about that. It's either yeah. a John Hughes film or yeah, it's sure. New York city backdrop. Those two are like the quintessential and I've gotten to live both of them. Well, I didn't come from John Hughes suburb money, but just like having that Illinois, backdrop though, yeah. to like Illinois, you know, the Winnetka area, all that good stuff. You know, I'm from Elgin originally. So, yeah. you know, about an hour drive, just far enough away where I'm, you know, not the riffraff hanging out in Winnetka, but, uh, but yeah, no, it was, it was super cool. New York and that, I, I couldn't have asked for more. Well, it's, that's the thing I love about uh, him creating a fictitious place. Uh, you know, everyone could say they're an hour from Sherman, Illinois, if they wanted. Uh, and, and, and yeah. uh, you know, you, you do bring up a very specific, I think Gen Xers in particular, I don't know what year you were born. I'm a 76 baby. Um, 72. Okay, so there we go. Uh, you know, as we grew up, uh, the vantage point that we have, I mean, a, a great observation with John Hughes movie, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, the breakfast club generation, um, and, 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 and what New York was to us, um, you know, the, 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 the dream part of it. And then what the reality actually is when you get there, well, you kind of got to have that dream part realized. What were some of the things that you learned, um, working for late show that you have taken to you, you know, to other projects? So every job I've ever been in, I compare it to working at Late Show and I tell them that we're on the air, even if it's a job that's not on the air. Obviously, yep. at the university, we're not on the air, but it's live TV. You're working in live TV. So what I've learned is you make it work. So even if you're at a desk job and something goes wrong, you make it work. You cover it up. You cut to commercial. You come back with a fresh thing. I mean, and it's honestly worked. I mean, everything is live TV, even if it's not live in the live sense. It's live TV. Yeah, it, it's it. Tape is rolling. You're on. Just keep smiling. Make it work. When the little ear thing fell out of my ear, I, you know, obviously I should have probably had a backup. But you know, we made it work. We kept going, and you know, you got yeah. to see whatever's behind me here, all the junk on the shelves and all that good stuff. But yeah, that's so. That's what I took away from it. And I was at, a, and like you say, New York again. Sorry to hound on the New York part, but I, I was there at the perfect time too because it wasn't totally Disneyfied yet. It wasn't taken over by Disney, so we still had all the, you know, the the peep show booths and the, so I got I got a little bit of the gritty New York. Yeah. along with the like cleaned up, sanitized streets, scrubbed New York. Yeah. And uh, I was there at, like the perfect time. So actually like when I would go back recently and look, I'm like, it's totally different. I mean, it's totally different, not in a bad way, but it's just totally different. So I feel like I was there just the right time before all of that had vanished. And I'm not saying that, you know, stay away from peep show booths. They're bad. No, <laughs> but no, I mean, it was, it was just a different experience to like, just see all that as just part of daily life, yeah. da daily life. Yeah. No judgment to the peep show crowd. Um, so That's right. You, <laughs> um, you said you talk a little bit about your love for Broadway. Did you see a lot of Broadway shows while you were there? I did. Not so much when I was uh, young, you know, uh, not deep pockets and all that kind of stuff. But as I got older, like, you know, probably in the last like well, I just moved back last year, probably in, like the last six, seven, eight years, I got a lot of Broadway exposure. And uh, that was really cool. That was really cool to see things, you know, from silly little musicals or like uh, jukebox musicals to like angels in America and all that stuff. And I actually got involved and worked really closely with Broadway cares, equity fights AIDS. And uh, they did a lot of really cool events and obviously a lot of important fundraising. So I got to go to a lot of opening night parties and meet a lot of other celebrities I hadn't yet met. Um, so it was really nice to kind of go full circle. I started in the whole celebrity realm unexpectedly, but yeah. then also worked with this wonderful organization um, and be able to help them out and uh, just participate in all that good stuff too. And get some culture, get some Broadway culture. So it was all good. It was all good. Fantastic. Uh, I, I want to do show and tell because it's fascinating to me that whenever somebody worked for the show um, or, or is it, you know, we've had people who didn't work for the show, but they're also, you know, uh, collectors as well of things. I'm a big fan of that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. I know you've, you, you were given a few things as, uh, as, as you were there and you have, a, you've acquired a few things uh, outside of that as well. What are some of your uh, Letterman collectibles that uh, you have? Yeah, so I had one thing that got destroyed when I was taken taken out of the frame. But David autograph 
So when I worked at 30 Rock and became yep. friends with all the mailroom crowd, they had a bunch of old posters um, and they had a picture of Dave and Johnny Carson together um, oh. for like an NBC and uh, Dave autographed it for me. You know, thanks for everything, Mike. You know, I, it ripped. So I, that unfortunately no longer exists. I hope I still have a picture of it. I don't have it now, but um, yep. so I do have some other things that were gifted to me sure. uh, over the years. And I've got some of the cool bumper oh, cars. Bumpers. What they shout would out cut to, to shout out to our boy, Mark Carson. Before we talk, shout out to yes. our boy, Mark Carson. We love Mark so much. We're going to have him back on the show here soon and, 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 and talk here. So you got some bumpers. Let's see what you got there. And we'll get some of these to Mark or something for like the next edition of the book or whatever. But, uh, so since I'm a Chicago guy, I have one of the, uh, they, these are from late night, of course, I think, yeah. but, uh, you know, one of the Chicago lifesavers I throw. And I think this is when they, they taped in Chicago and this was one of the bumpers they would have used, you know, to cut to commercial and back from commercial, all that good stuff, uh, yeah. from late night. And then I've got a second one here, um, a Chinese food takeout, whatever, uh, again, late night era. But uh, it's pretty cool, and it's all original. I mean, it's still on the little, you know, yeah, oh yeah, cardboard Absolutely. poster board here and stuff. Try to take care of these, get them framed someday. Definitely. And then uh, I got a, a third one here, uh, of course, Dave with his, you know, ubiquitous football that he's always tossing around with Walter yep. and all that good stuff. And uh, again, late night era, but uh, one of the old jackets cool wearing one of the old jackets there. Yeah, yeah, Mark, Mark one of the old jackets. And, so Mark is, you know, the whole uh, the cover of the book here. Um, he came on and he actually told the story of the original jacket and 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 how it was created in the first place and and, and you know kind of birthed on this this tradition with the jackets. Uh, those who watch the show know that I'm obsessed with the jackets, that kind of a thing. You well, also collected, yeah, I know, an I adorable know, little, little one, baby, a little jacket. It's so little. I don't know. You know, I, I got this online. I'll admit, but it's it's the cutest little late show jacket. I have little dogs. Oh, it's got eleven on it. So I guess it was the eleventh, eleventh. It is. I have the I have the full version of that jacket. That's that's one of the ones I have. That's that's a re perfect reproduction of it. Yeah. I was hoping to either lose a lot of weight to be able to wear it or <laughs> put it on my dogs or something. I don't know, but it's just super cool and super cute. So you know, I have to get a teddy bear and put it, you know, the little teddy bear in it or something like that. And then of course I have my late show jacket on here. Yep. And and as I was, you know, telling you before we did this little podcast that uh, I actually slowly acquired what I think, what I think was pretty much every late show jacket. And I, I used, I think it was Susan Hum's picture that she had taken in the studio one day of all the, you know, mannequins dressed up with the jackets. And I used that as my guide and uh, yep. spent a small fortune for it. But I had every jacket. Now, some of them are now safekeeping with friends and things like that. They're going to come back to me someday. They're going to come back <laughs> to me. But it was, you know, and they're all ill-fitting. Some are extra large, some are small, some are whatever. But whatever, it didn't really matter. I just wanted each of the jackets. So I have to work on, so if any of my friends are watching this, and you will be, um, you, you need to get my jackets back to me. Um, and we're, we're going to get those. So we're going to put them in a museum or something. I don't know. We're going to take a picture with me of them first, but they are going to a museum. But yeah, that's super cool. And of course, yeah. I have a whole bunch of the little hand warmers still in the original uh, cellophane wrappings, you know, that they, you know, the little chemical things you crunch them or whatever, and they warm up, put in your pockets, I have a whole bunch of those. And I, I might have some letterhead and stuff like that, that, you know, came with me, but uh, yeah. Oh, that's fun. That's, that's, that's so much fun. Um, okay. So I appreciate I'm, Now I am going to ask you about the George Lucas museum, because this is something I didn't know about until you kind of yeah. threw it out in the internet. I'm going to, I'm going to ask that. Uh, but before we do, before we move over to that, any other endearing, um, any other stories from when you were working in the Ed Sullivan theater every day? Uh, uh, any, anything that, that kind of comes to mind as some of the big highlights of your time at uh, late show with David Letterman. You know, this is going to be a cop out answer, but no, because just everything was so amazing. Like I, one thing I wish they would have done a little differently is when they had the interns. Um, Cause again, not everyone did get to meet Dave or see uh -huh. Dave on a regular basis. You know, he's, he's a, uh, he's, you know, he's uh, he's to himself. And I, understandably, I get that. And I was lucky enough to be at the holiday party and stuff and kind of bother him when he was trying to take his ice skates off to, to grab a photo. Cause I knew this was, now or never um type of a thing so i did it and so did mom and you know we got her picture but anyway but um one thing i would have loved to have have happen is you know kind of like they rounded up all the staff for the the picture on stage each year kind of mm -hmm. wish for each internship there would you know at the end of you know rehearsal have a designated time and then, oh, interns be here for your quick photo one two three and then everyone would have gotten a photo so right in hindsight that would have been an amazing thing because then everyone would have had that souvenir you know because i don't i don't think everyone did walk off or something like that but Every day was amazing. I mean, seriously, you know, eh, it's work at the end of the day. So some yep. days you kind of, you know, you know, scratch in your head wondering what the heck you're doing. But uh, no, it was just, it, it was amazing. And, uh, you know, all the people I met, the staff, I, I mean, everybody was su super nice. I mean, 
to be able to like, you know, I'm not a smoker, but like, you know, they're you know, hanging out outside the studio, you know, they're setting up for some silly little street skit that they're going to do with like, you know, someone diving from the top of the building into like a little pool or something you know? <laughs> like all that kind of stuff was just fun. Like what the, what the hell are they doing today? You know, there's an elephant on the street. Eh, well, it's just another day at work. It really was just another day at work. Eh, yeah, eh, there's an elephant. Okay. What are we doing today? So eh, it was just, it was just super fun. I mean, I, I'm truly blessed that I was able to get all that. Like, how many people can say that? What do we have? Like six, seven, eight interns a time times, you know, fall, spring, fall, spring. There's not a lot of people out there that can say that. So I'm, I'm yep. pretty damn lucky. So, yeah. Uh, well, I appreciate you taking time to to come and reminisce and talk about these things and do the show and tell here with us. That's fantastic. It, it, it um, yeah, it's great to hear all these stories and, 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 uh, and we love being an outlet for people to tell them if you, if you have any of your uh, former intern buddies that, that want to come on here as well and talk about this stuff, we're here for them for sure um you know we've got a few more that are going to be happening this summer uh as bonus episodes very very excited about our little intern i thought of the names okay. chris shakai there chris you Shakai's go is in that photo with me and tommy ruprecht uh tommy's tommy been ruprecht. on the show those okay. two so tommy's tommy been on chris. the show there and we go chris chris Woo! is coming on the show chris is coming on the show here in a couple of weeks well here. there you go well you can flash that photo and surprise the heck out of them I uh, will. but yeah I'm surprised that my old brain was able to figure that out, but it just came to me while you're talking. Sorry to interrupt oh, it's you. Fanta- no, don't be, don't be. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you so much for talking about your time uh, at Late Show. Now, now, when I'm a huge Star Wars fan as well. When I heard that Lucas was going to be building um, a museum and and uh, and he picked Chicago for it, it's now, I think that location moved to LA now, right? He's, he's going, he's going to do it there. But they spent a whole bunch of time and effort figuring out how they were going to do that. And apparently he was going to move all the models. Like, like, like there's pictures of him down in the basement at Skywalker ranch with all of the models of all the star destroyers and all the things around with them. Uh, apparently that was all going to be on display in Chicago for a time. Uh, did you actually work directly for, was it, was it Lucasfilm? Was it a separate society that he had built up for it? How did that, uh, how did that happen? funny little story so um when i was kind of back and forth between hoboken new jersey and uh, chicago um i applied for a random job working for melody hobson his wife and uh working at her investment firm and i applied for a job you know working in her office whatever and uh i didn't get that job and they did get a phone call that says uh, we we do have another job for him like okay you know i thought well you know there's going to be like a little administrative aid you know but it's sitting in a little corner a little closet somewhere you know typing papers or whatever um they said no 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 so you know they they told me to come on in to do my paperwork and all that good stuff and uh, they told me to pack a bag i thought pack a bag that sounds kind of odd so uh, they sent the car for me well apparently you know my first day on the job was flying on the jet from chicago to LA or to, to uh, San Francisco area yeah. um, with, with, with Melody and, and George and a few other folks. And Holy I spent, crap. you've been on a private plane with George Lucas. <laughs> I did. I, I have. And uh, it was just, I, I, you talk about surreal. Um, uh, and that was day one. That was day one. And uh, you know, I, I stayed out the, at the ranch for, uh, for a few days. Um, a beautiful little ranch, a little, a teeny little ranch, very modest little ranch. It was, it was adorable. Um, and uh, basically oh. I was working, I was working directly for George um, and kind of, kind of trying to get everything together with that project, the museum project and uh, trying to kind of, you know, the folks that have been working on it, kind of trying to bring everything together. Yep. Um, and, and I understand and it was going to be the, you know, the museum of narrative art. The Georgia yeah. So it wasn't just going to be star Wars. And I yep. think that's important to highlight. And I think that's, Absolutely. you know, I don't want to talk out of school here, but um, you know, so I, I think that, you know, a lot of people maybe didn't realize that aspect. I'm a huge star Wars fan, a huge star Wars fan. I mean, getting to meet George and get a picture with George was yeah. amazing. Uh, I mean, you know, again, you talk about Locke, um, but, um, you know, I, I think it was, it just wasn't the right time and place in my mind, in my mind, you know, you know, I understand the parks people were, pers- and I, you know, I get it. I'm, I'm big on parks too. So, you know, it was just, it was, it was just an unfortunate set of circumstances to me. Yeah. Um, and I'm, tr- again, I'm not trying to speak out of, speak out of school, share anything that I shouldn't share. Oh, um, no. And there's nothing really to, sh- and there's nothing really to share that I shouldn't yeah. share. But, um, I mean, everything that's out there is already out there, but, um, you know, I, I, I understood it. I understood it. And, uh, you know at the end of the day it was just an amazing experience for me um and, and he's just and he and his wife are super cool super cool people the museum I, I think it's open i think it's open i haven't really followed to be honest with you i haven't been out in la lately yeah. um but um it, you know it, it's just a super cool concept and and the artwork collection he has you know norman Rockwells. wells it's it's the telling of of stories through art including star wars including star wars yeah. and uh, just to be able to sit with the man at his kitchen table and just go over things and just 
you know, I was in awe and I had a lot of work cut out for me. Um, but he's just super respectful, super talented, super nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You've had, you got some stories there, Mike Summers. Uh, that is I unbelievable do. that you've, you, you've had some of these experiences here as we kind of move over to our, to, to, to close up this episode of the Letterman podcast. Yeah. Is there anything that you uh, wanted to make sure you got into the episode here today? Is there anything that you would kind of mentally prepared that you wanted to get in? Not really, but okay. I would just want to say thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you to oh. Letterman. Thank you to everyone on the staff. Then, now, through the years, whatever. Got to see Dave when he came out to Chicago to do one of his, uh, you know, his interview things with yep. uh what did the heck? Oh, he interviewed. Who did he interview? He interviewed Barack Obama. You were uh, at the, the Barack Obama, day. my next guest. I did. I did get to go to there. I to go to go go to there to go to that. That was amazing. Wow. I, and and there were no strings pulled to get tickets. I actually went online and applied just like a normal Joe Schmo to get them and yeah. got lucky and got to go see it. That was amazing. And I'm like, you know, there's my old boss sitting up there interviewing Barack Obama. Um, it was just super cool. And uh, so, thank you. I don't know how else to say it. Like, thank you. The The experience they gave me was a once in a lifetime. And it just kind of, I mean, you know, a little kid from the Midwest, like Dave, little kid from the Midwest who got yeah. all these amazing opportunities and just made things so much fun. Just made things so much fun and hardworking, but so much fun. So thank you is the biggest message I want to send to everyone out there. And I, you know, I don't give a lot of tidbits about stuff that they probably didn't already know, but man, roaming those hallways, doing all that stuff. I was lucky as a pig and you know what? Yeah. Um, have you watched many of the other, my next guests, uh, you know, since like, did I you did watch a little the Barack bit of the Obama launch. one? Did you watch the Barack Obama I, one? Oh, absolutely. I had to see if I could see myself in the audience. Sure. Uh, was there a lot cut from it? Uh, I wouldn't say a ton was cut really. Yeah. A, ton, a ton wasn't cut. You know, I mean, some of the stuff was, you know, strategically edited and stuff, but there wasn't really a lot that didn't make it in there. I mean, they're both such great speakers anyway, and they know what they're going to talk about and all that good stuff that there's really not a lot to cut or that you'd want to cut. Yeah. Um, so I don't think it was terribly edited, to be honest with you, from what I can recall. Um, but yeah, that was amazing. I didn't watch a lot though. I mean, I watched like the first uh, series or whatever you want to call it, the first yeah, season, the season of it. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I've really watched a lot after that. Um, but uh, but yeah, it was pretty interesting. And I'm glad he's still doing stuff like that. I mean, he's kind of archiving things for history, but sure. also having fun with it. So it's kind of like the Letterman legacy lives on, um, well, but in form. a different yeah, way. Him sw switching to long form, I, 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 uh, I've I loved the evolution of it. He was always such a big fan of Tom Snyder and now kind of near at this part of his career. I'm not even going to say the end of it because you never know. He may reinvent himself again and and, and come up with something, uh, uh, you know, something new. But uh, at this phase where he's at doing the long form is very, very interesting. The Barack Obama episode, the President Barack Obama episode uh, of, of my next guest, one of the things that I loved, and I think this is kind of a good way for us to kind of um to button this one up the way that they finished the epi the, that interview i don't know if you remember or not but one of the things that dave was kind of moving to the close and president obama actually said, oh hold on a second hold on let's let's let, let me ask you something and he said you know um if there's any way that we can take you know we've both been very very blessed and had some good fortune and some good luck along the way uh can we take something and sprinkle that onto everybody else and 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 uh, and then Dave talks about how how lucky he has been to get to where he's at and that kind of a thing. Uh, it seems like that would have been an extremely inspirational room to be in at that moment uh, when they were doing that. Did 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 you feel it? Did you feel the goosebumps at that point? I mean, that was a that was a pretty big moment you got to see. Yeah, it was, and and I've also been fortunate to meet Barack Obama a few times um, and and all that at the White House. Um, so I, I had I had that moment with Barack Obama, but to have both people that I yeah. had met at one point in time being in that room saying things like that. And it really was about hope and change and just, you know, uh, realizing the full potential in people and the full potential of our country and the world and all that good stuff. I mean, however, uh, whatever you want to put a spin on it, but yeah, so it, it was profound. Um, I thought in a very simple way, it doesn't have to be complicated to be profound. And it was profound. Oh, well, they, they love that. Very, very well said. Uh, oh, we're going to finish here. Okay. So I, I, we're calling an audible here. Uh, I'm going to finish by building, doing a commercial. We have one sponsor. One sponsor only here at the Letterman Podcast, and that is Rupert G and the Hello Deli. Um, you know, we talk about things coming to a close. Right now, Rupert is is in the midst of selling the deli, um, and it's a it's a, it's a big deal. You talk about errors that are ending here, um, but you can still go to hello delicom and you can get Late Show with David Letterman merchandise. You can get hats and caps and mugs and shirts of all sorts, long sleeve, short sleeve, that kind of thing, and you can even get Rupert G's Hello Deli T shirts. Highly recommend to grab them now because it's going to be a, a collector's item. I assume 
Michael, that when you were uh, you were there, you visited the deli once or twice. Every day, and I still go back. And he and May always remember me, and I love it. I absolutely love it. Oh, they okay. Well, if you want to say, you know what, uh, they watch this show. If you want to give a, a little shout out or a congratulations to Rupert, now's the time to do it. Hey, Rupert. Hey, May. Congratulations on all that you've done. People are going to buy all that stuff. They better hurry because, like you say, it is going to sell out. Um, and uh, I miss you. I'll see you again. Good luck on the next chapter. Oh, there we go. Uh, Mike Summers, thank you so much for being part of the Letterman podcast today. Uh, that's why we do this show, just to talk about some of these moments and 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 uh, how they impacted people, uh, the people that work there and how they're still impacted to this day. Uh, you know, again, we celebrate the greatest body of broadcasting work in history, that of David Letterman and company. This has been another episode of the Letterman podcast with Mike Chisholm. Coincidentally, I am Mike Chisholm. Thank you and good night. Overcoat and underpants.